Welcome everyone to our latest roundtable series at EdSource. My name is Ann Vosquez, Executive Director of EdSource. Part-time adjunct professors make up the backbone of California's community college system. Before the pandemic, adjuncts taught nearly half the classes at the state's 72 community college districts. Enrollment drops have caused a new layer of concern for a system that serves about 1.5 million students. Many of these instructors work semester by semester. Today, we wanna to address the pressing issues and most importantly, what does it mean for the students? We also wanna look ahead to see what can be done. And lastly, EdSource would not be able to bring us all together uh, for this type of conversation were it not for the support of our funders, including the ECMC Foundation for making today's roundtable possible. Now for our introductions. First, I'd like to welcome to our panel, William Herbert, distinguished lecturer at Hunter College and the executive director of the National Center for the Study of Collective Bargaining in Higher Education and the Professions. Please also welcome Kenneth Brown, immediate past president of the California Community College Trustees Board and a trustee at El Camino Community College District in Torrance. He is also an adjunct professor. Next, I'd like to introduce Jose Fierro, president-elect of the Community College League of California and president of Cerritos Community College. I'd like to also welcome Wendy Brill Weinkoop, president of the Faculty Association of the California Community Colleges and a professor at College of the Canyons. Next, I am happy to introduce John Martin, chair of the Ad advocacy group, California Part-Time Faculty Association and an adjunct at two Northern California community colleges. And our moderator today is EdSource reporter, Thomas Peel. Welcome everyone. And Thomas, I will pass it on to you. Oh, thank you, Anne, and good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining us. As we all know, community colleges play a vital role in the state's economic development and they feed students into the UC, CSU systems, and private universities. There are 115 brick and mortar colleges that make up 72 districts governed by locally elected trustees. System-wide, part-time instructors known as adjuncts make up 67% of teaching ranks. They work often district by district, cobbling together full-time employment out of part-time jobs. If they're offered health insurance, it's often expensive and spotty. They speak often of not being paid for office hours or being paid less for office hours than they're paid for instructional hours and not being paid for prep time and grading time. It is often said that their working conditions are student learning conditions, that if an adjunct professor doesn't have office hours, it's that professor's students who lose access and fall behind. Yet these conditions are not necessarily unique to California's community colleges. And I'd like to take the first question to William Herbert. Um, William, how does this fit in nationally with the employment of part-time academics across academia? Well, first, I want to thank Ed Source for inviting me to participate in this important roundtable. Um, the State of Community College uh, adjunct faculty in California is, re is really not particularly different from the rest of the country. What is different is that California has the largest number of community colleges of any state with a public sector collective bargaining law. And my research center knows this well because we've over the past year we've been conducting a survey of all collective bargaining relationships around the country and despite our best efforts we, there remain 15 california community college faculty units that have not yet to respond to our survey so we would encourage anyone in the audience who's an administrator or a faculty representative to please submit a response for your institution the purpose of, of our study is to be able to have a accurate data about the current state of, of collective bargaining for all collective to bargaining units. Now, um, one thing I think you need to keep in mind is that um, the size and scale of, of adjunct faculty in this state and other states is not an accident. It is a result of policy choices made by elected officials over the past four or five decades. Among those has been choices such as tax cuts for the wealthy at the expense of public higher education. So just as our roads and bridges are crumbling, our society's intellectual infrastructure is at a breaking point. 
Um, so one of the things that I, I think is important to contextualize is the fact that 40 years ago, our na the National Center at Hunter College held a conference, um, our annual conference, with the theme of campus bargaining at the crossroads. During that conference, we had a panel titled The Use and Abuse of Part-Timers uh, with, with an administrator and faculty representative both speaking. During this presentation in, uh, that, that, at that uh, conference 40 years ago, the administrator admitted that part-time adjunct faculty were necessary because of state budgetary constraints and also raised the fact that um, they were needed for, because of changes in enrollment. She differentiated between the adjuncts, but she, and she denied that the, there would be, uh, the, the adjuncts would wind up replacing full-time positions. In response, the, the union president predicted that part-time adjunct faculty would result in the replacement of full-time tenure track. And she also delineated a series of conditions that are very similar to today. She discussed, the, she described that adjunct faculty were being treated as second subordinate, second class faculty, and were being, and she used the term of working in a ghetto-like existence. That's her phrase. Um, adjunct, she also described adjuncts lacking regular office, regular offices and being deprived of the ability to effectively mentor students. She talked about high, adjuncts being hired in a haphazard way um, on an immediate need with very little process or standards. And she also talked about the lack of a systemized approach that undermined accountability and deprived faculty of work stability, including last minute course correct cancellations. Um, she also talked in terms of ex, uh, adjunct faculty describing themselves as feeling exploited because they're being paid on a flat sum for each course and depri deprived of fringe benefits like retirement and health care. Lastly, and very similar to what you, you just described, Tom, is the fact that um, she described that um, adjunct faculty as being academic gypsies who travel from campus to campus on multiple campuses um, and, and, and being treated poorly. So from a national perspective, we see that the conditions 40 years ago have continued to just has expanded in terms of the number of continued faculty and that this now we're in a situation now where we're finding nationwide a large growth in unionization efforts among continued faculty along with with uh, graduate assistance unionization and increased militancy and so then that, that we, we for people interested we have uh, a report we published in 2020 describing this the, the broad growth and unionization among uh, uh, t uh, adjunct faculty and tenure track faculty. Thank you for that. I'd like to go to Ken first and then Jose on what you're hearing locally um, from the people that you represent. Can you represent local elected officials and the, and the League of California Community Colleges, the statewide organization? Um, Enrollment's down and going down. So what's the, what is the perspective, Ken, of trustees at the current state of the system? I, I appreciate that, Thomas. Um, first of all, thank you for the, for the invitation. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm wearing a lot of hats on this, on this, uh, on this call as an as a adjunct, a current adjunct, uh, 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 also representing locally my, my district at El Camino and, and also um, past president as of a couple of days ago uh, for the uh, statewide trustee board. Um, and so let me answer that. Let me try to answer that question in, in a couple of different ways. Um, because locally, at my, my hyper local, I'm, I'm, I'm currently sitting in Inglewood. And, and if you ever visited Los Angeles or in, into LAX, that's you, you basically fly over my district. Um, and so it's, it's, it's pretty urban uh, district, very large. Um, and so when we talk about hyper local ef effects of, of, of what's going on at the adjunct world, I mean, the first and foremost is the access to class, uh, the access to, to, for my students, um, you know, so, and that depends on, you know, pre pandemic that's, that's, that, that is dependent on, you know, budget that's dependent on, um, uh, you know, the need, uh, of, 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 of our students. And so, but but you compile the you know pandemic on top of that you know things get 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 mucky with you know online or distance learning um, and so there was there's always uh, you know as a as a uh, uh, as a adjunct there's always that feeling of okay you know will I be needed this next semester 
Um, so you're always kind of waiting for that, that email or that conversation from the department chair. Uh, you're, you're kind of keeping your, your, your eyes on the budget to see what's going on with, with you know, how that budget is affecting your, your campus. And so, again, from a hyper-local uh, perspective, uh, I, I, you know, that has been, you know, the life for me as, as, a, as an adjunct faculty. Um, I'm also in physics, right? And so, you know, unlike maybe English or, or history, not everybody has to take physics, right? And so there's even that, right, uh, as, a, as, a, as, 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 as kind of a, a cloud that hovers over you. It's like, okay, hmm, well, if, if, you know, the department or the school changes the, the you know, the, the requirements, it's like, how does that affect me at, 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 at my, um, uh, in my department during, during the classes that I'm, that I'm concentrating on? So I, I think there's I think there's there's anxiety. I think there's always anxiety, but I think with with coming out of the pandemic, not really understanding where our our students are are, are looking to be and wh where they want to go. I think I think that compiles this anxiety that that not only our adjuncts but our, our faculty and our administrators, frankly, uh, are 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 experiencing. I think what I'm seeing at the uh, state level in my, my, my role as, as president of the, of the trustees, like, yes, we d we're definitely seeing a downward trend on enrollment. Um, we're trying to kind of understand where this, where this is happening or, 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 or why. Um, you know, if you look at what's happening at the UCs and the Cal States, you don't hear any kind of discussion about enrollment uh, uh, you know, loss of enrollment. That's because, you know, frankly, you know, the UCs, you know, as they take 2% of their applicants, they can increase that, that number to 2.5% and then the, all their seats are filled, right? At the, Cal, at the, at the community college level, we, we're, we, we, don't, we don't have that luxury. We don't have the luxury of turning away 90% of the people who apply. Uh, as, as Chancellor Oakley would say, we take the top 100 uh, percent of everyone who applies to community college, which is is fine, it's great, and that's the way it should be. Um, but when we look at the enrollment and we look at you know going from 2.1 million students in the state to 1.8, 1.9 million in the state, that's a 20 percent loss. You know, El Camino, we're under that, we're we're like 17 percent, but that's still a loss. And where are we seeing this? Mainly, and it's it's, it's really our, our students of color and our underserved uh, and our underserved students. So, at a statewide level, yes, we're definitely seeing this 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 loss of enrollment. But we're really trying to figure out where those students are going. Yes, a, many of them are going to work uh, because of pandemic. Um, you know, frankly, you know the the you know at my at my campus, you can go across the street to McDonald's and to Chick Fil A, and you can earn twenty two dollars an hour. Right. And so a lot of a lot of people and a lot of our students don't cannot afford. And so it, that answer is 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 multifaceted. Um, and, and again, I, I there, there, it's, there's not one silver bullet to yeah, I wish there was. There's not one silver bullet of, hey, you know, this is the problem. And that's where we that's where we should go to fix things, things, things. It's, it's multifaceted. And I, and I appreciate this forum for for looking at uh, a lot of those issues. Jose, um, in your position and your colleagues in similar positions, you've got to ensure that there are enough classes to meet student demand and people to stand in front in front of those classrooms. How do you deal with fluctuating or declining enrollment and making a decision over who's going to be teaching at a college in the fall? Good afternoon. Thank you, Thomas. And this is an interesting question because in my view, and just to give you a little bit of context, I started my career as an adjunct faculty member, and, and so did my wife, actually, until a few years ago. Um, so I've been on both ends, and the challenging part is that oftentimes, because similar to what Mr. Herbert mentioned, years of policy have led to disparity, and this disparity often put two groups in competition, meaning full-time faculty versus full-time versus part-time faculty. So in a state like California, uh, with collecting bargaining, uh, oftentimes you have contracts that give priority of assignment to full-time faculty 
versus part-time faculty because of the rights the full-time faculty have over part-time faculty. And whether or not we agree with this particular uh, arrangement, I think what we need to look at is why have we gotten to this point and what can we do to actually begin to address a policy issue that is significantly larger than a discussion that can be had at any one campus. Because even if for whatever reason that was to change at Cerritos College, that will only impact a tiny fraction of the adjunct faculty that works across the state level. So I mentioned earlier in my comments, uh, both my wife and I began our, our, our education career as adjunct faculty. There was a semester about four years ago, the, my wife taught in six different campuses. This much she could teach from place to place, and every place has different working conditions based on the contract that has been negotiated by the local chapters. And please do not take this as a dig on the local chapter. This happens because larger policy changes. Local chapters do the negotiation and is required by law and so are the districts, but the outcome of that is based on the rights they have been already given to each group based on how the system was developed. So, so to me, the way to talk about working conditions and employment uh, for part-time part faculty is to look at the larger system issues rather than what we find in 115 different colleges, because there are 115 different ways in which that will be addressed. And we'll see, we see currently that that does not work. Wendy, you represent both full and part-time faculty all over the state. And Jose makes a good point about the conflict sometimes of full versus part-time. What are you hearing from your members? What's going on, on the ground right now within the context of declining enrollment and the pushback on working conditions? Thank you so much. And I appreciate being here today and having this conversation. I think it's a really important one. And I've been in higher ed close to 30 years in California and over 25 years in the community colleges. And the one thing that I have seen in the community colleges in the 25 plus years is enrollment has gone up and enrollment has gone down and enrollment's gone back up and enrollment's gone back down. Now we've been experiencing a pretty significant drop in a short period of time, but in all the time that I've been in the community colleges, uh, a fair majority of the courses across the state, right? The majority have been taught by part-time faculty who are at will employees. So when uh, enrollment drops, they lose their jobs, but honestly, part-time faculty are always in a state of job insecurity. So it's not just enrollment drops, it's more significant. Job secure insecurity is more significant, but it's a constant state. And so I, you know, I asked myself, you know, why do we have part-time faculty really for two main reasons? We have them to cover courses that are niche or there's small enough sections that, you know, they don't really require a full load from one single faculty member. Those are often in a specific area like career education. And then we also have them to balance the swing of enrollment. But we have had, and like I said, in the time that I've been in the colleges, community colleges, we've had an over-reliance on adjunct faculty because most of our districts save money um, by uh, only paying uh, adjuncts for classroom hours, not paid as William uh, stated so wonderfully when we started, uh, on, you know, not paid for office hours. They don't even have offices, uh, often not for professional development or benefits. And this is really creating poor working conditions for the majority of our faculty, again, because the majority of our faculty are part-time or adjuncts. So I think it's important to realize that we have built a system where the majority of our faculty who are part-time, their working conditions are our student learning conditions. So for me, it starts to circle back around to what, you know, what we value. I think uh, it's ironic um, that the California community colleges of all of our systems of higher ed in California, we have CSUs and UC and the community colleges, we take a top 100% of our applicants, yes, 
but we're also taxed with the responsibility of lifting our citizens, you know, through education out of poverty. But this same system pays the majority of our faculty unfair compensation. So you're asking those who are unfairly compensated to lift others out of poverty. Um, and then simultaneously um, to, you know, the people on the panel, my apologies, but simultaneously as a system in the last 25 years, I've seen our administration positions grow astronomically. So we're growing administrative positions, yet at the same time, we're saying we can't remedy this part-time um, adjunct faculty issue. And I want to note that most administration positions are full-time and have benefits. I, I have never met a part-time administrator. I'm sure there's a couple, but the far majority, I would say probably 99% are full-time with benefits. So again, I'm starting to wonder if the decline in enrollment um, is linked to our system's values. Uh, the system is not focused on the connection between supporting faculty and their working conditions. Um, and, and therefore supporting our students and our st students' learning conditions. So um, at this moment, we have unprecedented state budget surplus. Like we've never seen a budget like this ever. Um, and at the same time, we have this declining enrollment. So I see this as an opportunity. Maybe we can make some large policy shifts. The state can help provide new funding sources for part-time pay parity, for office hours, for healthcare, for professional development for money to convert those part-time positions to full-time positions, but local districts have to commit to righting the wrong. So it's not just about state policy. And I'll, I'll leave it there and pass it on to my buddy, John. John, um, thank you for being here. And, and thank you for that, Wendy. Um, John, you're an adjunct, you're on the ground, you're in history classes at two different colleges. You've got students coming to you with questions outside of class, and you're in a position sometimes where you're not paid for office hours. How does that work for the student? Uh, thank you, Thomas and Ed Storch for having this very important dialogue, and I hope we will continue to do this. Uh, dialogue like, I, like this statewide has been zero. Um, and that's the disheartening part of our uh, situation here today. Uh, CPFA has been on the ground since 1998 because nobody was listening to us since 1998. Nobody was listening. And that includes, I hate to say this, these statewide organizations such as our unions, in fact, even. But the last 10 years, though, our part-time faculty had decided to not only support CPFA, but also work within their own affiliation, fact included CCA, CFT, triple CI and what have you. And we have gained a lot of voices there. And now we are starting to see some shift at these local, uh, our statewide affiliations, such as AB 1856, which is an attempt to increase the workload, and AB 1752. And I'm really proud to, to see that CTA, in fact, and CFT and triple CI have turned the corner. They're listening to us. However, there are a group of people, the powers that be, are dragging their heels, and they are in strong opposition to, to amend our working conditions. The league is one of them. The chancellor's office is the other one, Oakley. And Oakley right now came from a system, a community college system, that's being sued by part-time faculty for a wage theft. And so now we're, seeing, uh, now we're seeing something to the effect that legislation is still uh, a card that we will play, but now we're going to be going to the courts to rectify the wrong that's been going on for 40 plus years and in, in the last 20 plus years. Now, Thomas, you asked me about office hours. I reached a point in my career, and I know other part-time faculty as well. They are refusing to meet with students outside the classroom. And they always ask me, oh, why, Mr. Martin? Well, first of all, I tell them I'm a part-time faculty person, instructor. And they're all shocked that I'm part-time. And then number two, I asked them, would you work for free? And they said, of course not. I don't work for free. Well, then why should I? I'm not sure what else I can explain about that situation. Why should I work for free? 
Now, I, you know, I want to meet with them right after class, right before class, but I'm not going to hold office hours unless I get paid. And the subject of office hours is a sore point, too. Many of us only get paid as dictated by the local districts. Some districts don't office hours. Some districts offer office hours at a rate that is way below our hourly rate. Some only give office hours maybe one hour per week, no matter what the workload is, no matter how many classes you have, how many students you have, you're only allowed to have one hour per week. And we all know that full-time faculty are required to hold five hours per week. And they're paid for it. And they have an office. How about that? Uh, so I can go on about this issue, issue here about office hours. And then, it, like you mentioned, Thomas, uh, there are some health benefits, but again, it's very spotty. And there's office hour funding, very spotty. And there's office, and there's a parity uh, increase in wages. And that's also spotty. Why is it spotty? Because the districts have to fill out paperwork. The district have to pay half of the money they borrow or not borrow, take from the state if they offer funding. I know two directors of finance, and I said, don't you take money from the state when the state offers office hour money or this and that? No. I go, why not? It's too much work. And they have to pay 50%. And they don't have funding for it. So again, the state can talk all they want about the value of part-time faculty and all these categorical fundings or seniority rights that was acquired that we were able to get about four years ago. Uh, kudos to CTA working on that on the ground. Um, that is being exploited too. So if there's no mandate, no teeth, no accountability, a lot of these laws, even the currently on, on that's being pushed, there's no mandate, there's no accountability. And so this, this exploitation keeps getting bigger and larger. And yeah, we're the biggest, largest CC system in the world. And I would also argue we are the largest system that exploits the majority of its workers. Think about that. We are the largest you, system that exploits us. John, thank you for that. I, I did want to jump in with a question from the audience and maybe direct this towards um, Kenneth and Jose. A uh, question about the path to full-time status. And you know, how difficult um, or not difficult is that um, at the college level? And uh, what can be done to make that a, a more um, easier track, I guess? Well, tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to start this and maybe I can tee it up for, for Dr. Fierro because that, th those, that question, uh, it's a great question, it really depends on the district. It really depends on the campus. It really depends on the, the department, right? And so, I, you know, I hate to, I hate to, I hate to end my my answer with it depends. But but those are some of the those are some of the major factors, right? And I think we can we can understand that. I think one thing to consider as that question is being asked is is there a better way or is there some structure that um, districts or the chancellor or the system can follow uh, to make things um, uniform. Um, and I think that is, uh, I, I think that's difficult, right? I think from my perspective, uh, uh, from my seat, right? It's, I wanna keep as much control locally as, as, as possible. And that includes uh, how my uh, uh, employees get uh, hired and how my employees get uh, uh, promotions, raises, and and, uh, and 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 so forth. So, you know, I, I so what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to say, well, you know, you look at Cerritos, they're doing everything, you know, the wrong way. You know, I'm, I'm not going to do that because Cerritos uh, locally serves, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, it's it's a it's a different kind of locality, right? And so. I, I, I will forever uh, encourage uh, local control and local decision making. And I think this is one of those, those areas where I would defer to um, the, the boots on the ground who are, who are making those decisions. I, and, I, and I'll tee that up for Dr. Fierro. 
If I can interject here, I'm sorry. Local control has got us in this mess. You need to understand that. This is the forum on part-time faculty. Local control got their head in the sand. We need to get local control to think about the greater picture here. And it starts at the top. It starts with you, it starts with Jose, it starts with the lake, it starts with the chancellor's office, it starts with the governor, et cetera. Local control has got us in this mess. Okay, I'd like to go back to uh, Jose to follow up on that and then I'll have a question for William. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, you know, if you ask again, as I said before, 116 campuses, 116 different uh, answers. Uh, we locally hire a lot of our part-time faculty into into jobs, but but again, I don't think that is the solution to a systemic problem. I think it will require us to look at how we employ adjunct faculty in a different manner that meets their needs until we can actually find ways to balance the scale. So for me, a step one, for instance, and uh, uh, this is just a wild idea, it's uh, nothing that I have said or would do, it's just, it requires a different way of thinking in my opinion. So for instance, on, on benefits, Every district does them different and some they don't, right? We, we do have a system for, for a level of benefits for our part-time faculty, but some of our neighboring districts do not. However, there is money allocated every year and this year even more so across the state for part-time faculty benefits. In my opinion, that should be an opportunity for us to look as to how we can enroll part-time faculty that teach whatever many units, I don't know what will be the correct calculation there, into a statewide system of benefits utilizing the purchasing power, one, that is given in this year budget, and two, that has been already given to the districts, and maybe saying, you know what, we're going to take back all that, and this is going to be a big umbrella through the state in which we can affiliate community college employees that meet these specific characteristics. The, the, the power that we will have in numbers, not just the numbers of faculty, but the amount of money that collectively is spent, I think could provide something a little better than what we individually could. So, so Jose, but what you're saying is that you're you're promoting that it's part-time faculty forever. I mean, the question was how do we make it more full-time? I, I, I did and not to say make such it, a thing. To make it a little I, I did better not say is such a thing. I think I was interrupt halfway to my comment. So one one question is the benefit, because that is something that it is an incredibly pressing issue, not just for part-time faculty, but health benefits in this country are not what they should be when you compare to developed countries. Then the next part, the path to full-time teaching should be a combination of the responsibility of local districts and the state making a commitment in education. And the reason that I'm saying that is that because the last several decades, every time that their budget cuts, the budgets come out from the educational system. We are more fortunate than most in California. There is not quite as severe, but when you look at this issue across the United States, K-12 and community college budgets always, always suffer creating a system in which there is an encouragement to pay low wages to those who do not work part-time. And in some instances, low wages to even those who work full-time. So it is a competition within the system for the scarce resources rather than a competition as to how we can make education more relevant as a value of the state and the nation. Why doesn't the lake support AB 1752, Parity Bill? The state will provide money and the lake opposes it. 
Um, I, I'm I'm a I'm a, a stranger to the California situation. I feel like I'm at a, a dinner table with family. So let me just inter interject with some some thoughts from where I come from in terms of running a national center that's been studying these issues for the decades. First is to, I think everyone has to recognize that these problems are long st stemming problems and not going to get resolved through as someone said a magic bullet. Right. There has to be a recognition that this has been going on for 40 or 50 years and it's just gotten worse. Um, and so the question then becomes sort of well, what are some of the issues and how what are some ways of, of, of starting to build in a pathway towards solutions? And it seems to me there are three different pathways. One is on a uh, on a statewide level to establish some kind of minimum standards concerning compensation, benefits and working conditions. They have just minimum standards that could then be supplemented on a local level, but minimum standards established by the state um, with regard to contingent faculty and, and uh, their compensation and working conditions and benefits. Um, and, and that would be, uh, again, a statewide uh, uh, proposition. The other would be some developing some kind of standard. A part of that standard would be requiring that uh, contingent faculty have some due process rights that they would be able to uh, have greater uh, understanding of, of what's going to happen and that they're not going to get denied a position for unlawful reasons. Due process is a constitutional pr proposition. This is not a, 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 a new idea. Just notice an opportunity to be heard in advance of a decision being made. And I think that would be a sort of a, a just cause provision. We'd, we'd have benefits to create a, a greater degree of stability. Um, those, those, are, those are sort of, you know, for something to be done in Sacramento through state legislation. Um, the second way of approaching this would be through what could be done uh, through collective bargaining. Um, and collective bargaining, remember, is not, it doesn't guarantee perfection. No, no negotiations result in perfection. They result in compromise. And through compromise results in that not everyone gets what they want. Um, and so you're going to have contracts which are going to be um, not as good as other contracts. Um, and there could be differences within the bargaining unit as to what is what is the most important priority, which can lead to, to issues I think that was raised before. But something that could be done to help harmonize the situation would be for community colleges to do what other employers do, which is work together in a multi-employer situation to bargain on a collective basis, not just on your uh, with regard to your particular campus, and to develop a standard that would be applicable to multiple campuses, so that there would be a, a, a master contract that could then be negotiated with the unions and could create a a, a better uh, playing field for everyone. A part of that negotiations could be creating a pathway towards full-time employment. And there are examples where this has been done, where um, unions and management have been able to negotiate language to provide a, a pathway from going from being an adjunct faculty member to a full-time faculty member. But that's going to require there to be standards. And reality of standards is that some people are going to meet them and some people may not meet them. So again, it's not perfection, but it could be a basis. It could be something to be considered in terms of, and there are examples where there has been these kind of negotiations at more larger institutions rather than uh, community colleges, but it's certainly something that could be done. And I think if you think about a doing it in a way where uh, community colleges and unions function on a geographic area, geographic basis, you may wind up being able to resolve some of the issues that's being discussed here, and it, it's consistent with consortiums, which are which are networks of colleges that that um, go on around the country, and it would just be in addition to that that idea of a consortium. And then, lastly, and this is mo most simply, which something is is for. Um, institutions that are uh, on the institutional level, not looking for legislation, not even the negotiating, but sitting down and trying to standardize the process of how adjunct faculty are treated and, and what the conditions are and whether those conditions are really meet the values that each institution has about what they're trying to do in terms of educating our students. And that becomes sort of understanding what is the procedures, what are the standards, regularizing that, um, uh, documenting it, and having a procedure laid out so that everyone knows and it's not based on 
um, haphazard kind of decision making. Um, that takes time, but I think that that would give a, a, it would, would would be a big step forward for institutions to do that. And then on the labor side, on the union side, there's also a, a similarity about trying to figure out ways in which to come up with solutions that could be involved with not necessarily negotiating things that are what's called you know non-mandatory subjects, which are non-mandatory, but you could have some kinds of labor management discussions to come up with solutions towards. Uh, trying to respond to a situation which has been going on for decades and needs adjustments, I think, as everyone in this group, in this family, have uh, agree upon, that there needs to be something to be done. So I think those are three pathways that could be beneficial for moving things forward. Bill, I just would like to look at this from a governing perspective for a moment. We effectively have 72 local boards, big state, it's a blue state, it's a red state. Are there better run systems that you can point to where we'd have more, just a more level consistency instead of this district by district crazy quilt about an adjunct gets this here and that over there and, and they're very disparate. Well, it, 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 the City University of New York, the community colleges are a part of the CUNY system. And there's one contract that's applicable to both community colleges and senior colleges. And so mm -hmm. there, is, there is a consistency among the various community colleges. At the State University of New York, community colleges, there's a similarity with, with what's being described with California, but there's still the, the, the SUNY chancellor still has some sway and ability to try to develop uh, some kind of uniformity, although it's not close, it's not anything close to what exists at, at, at the City University of New York. But frequently, the question of uniformity is something that can be done through, uh, and you're talking about governance, would be creating minimum standards. It, that doesn't minimum standards does not eliminate um, uh, the ability of, of 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 colleges to apply those minimum standards or improve those minimum standards, but they're minimum standards, and 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 so that's that's sort of a, one way of approaching it. Um, and and the and going back to my idea of having um, colleges working together and negotiating um, as um, as one is as a multi-employer kind of bargaining, you know, that's been done in other industries. This is not a, this is not a, a new concept. Other industries where uh, where where businesses were were in competition, they they found there was greater uniformity. It was in everyone's interest to have negotiations done as part of a master agreement. Um, so you think trucking and uh, clothing industry, et cetera, those are possibilities. And and one other one other suggestion I have, which I f failed to mention before, is one other way of helping develop uniformity would be perhaps an agreement to create a hiring hall, a hiring hall in which uh, faculty could get find the positions through a hiring hall, working with with uh, with a the unions running a hiring hall that could then send. Um, uh, f a faculty out for positions, but on, on governance, I think there there is nothing that would prohibit legally for um, community colleges to work together with their unions and bargain as one, and not as one, but in in in, in a, as as a master for aim for a master agreement. Thanks, Ken. I'd like to go to you for a moment. Thomas, um, can I please? I've been waiting a while. Can I get in here? Sure, please. Wendy, Thank you. So it's you know it's we have been working on a lot of these things. We've had in our uh, since 1988 a uh, uh, ratio where we're supposed to flip it from 75 percent of courses taught by part time faculty to 75 percent taught by full time faculty. We do have rehire and seniority rights for part time faculty uh, in law. We we have one of the highest, as you said earlier, William, one of the highest amounts of uh, uh, local unions or collective bargaining agreements, um, you know, in, in the whole entire country, yet we still have a lot of the struggles that we, that um, others are seeking to, uh, to remedy in the state. And the one thing that I don't think has been mentioned, although you, William, you did mention it, but I think that we all need to acknowledge it is that if we're committed to fixing this problem, truly fixing it, that we have to work across system partners. And I can say that 
you know, we had a, in 2018, we have $50 million for new full-time faculty money and almost all new full-time faculty were part-time. So that's converting part-time faculty to full-time faculty with benefits. Um, and then again, last year we had a hundred million dollars and yet, even though we've had several times money specifically dedicated to remedying the problem, we have money for part-time office hours. We hopefully will have money for part-time healthcare. Um, we have system partners that are fighting each other or not utilizing that money. We haven't changed that ratio of full-time to part-time. It's still 75% part-time pretty much and um, 25 part-time. It's made a little movement more from enrollment decline than any reason. So it needs to be more than money um, and policy. It also has to be a commitment from the system that we need to do better for our students because our students deserve to have people who are committed to them full-time and supported um, and are not a second class, um, you know, set of working conditions just for these faculty that could be let go at any moment in time. So I think that's what's missing is the commitment from um, from the system partners, both at the state level and at the local level to make sure that we remedy this. And that hasn't happened in the years that I've been in the system. Thank you. The healthcare issue has come up and I'd like to take it to Ken for a moment. Um, Ken is most of us know there's 33 districts in the state that offer no health care to part-time faculty and the remaining districts that do it's a very inconsistent level of coverage from uh small stipends to policies with large um employee contributions this if this 200 million dollars um in the governor's budget remains and the legislature keeps it in and this money is available. What's your thinking on whether your trustee colleagues will that um, will expand healthcare coverage? Will they um, readily apply for the reimbursement meant to ease the cost on districts to get the healthcare out? Yeah, I, I think they're well. Again, can't speak for all 475 trustees, but I think um, they would greatly uh, go after uh, what uh, is is fair. Um, I think uh, I don't think they would not go after uh, those those that that funding. I think I think one of the I think one of the main. Um, not, I think trustees in the state are, are 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 do not want to get their districts in trouble as far as financial wise, and so uh, any unfunded mandates, any unfunded um, uh, you know legislation, they're 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 very skeptical on that, right? But if we, I I have not seen any kind of uh, of, of desire to withhold money to be greedy, if you will, right? I've, I've only seen hesitancy to, to spend long-term funds on, uh, or uh, long-term efforts on short-term funds. So I think, you know, the, the situations that you just pointed out, I think that would be desirable. I don't think that in general, uh, trustees would be opposed to uh, supporting those efforts, um, and but again, I I I I I try not to speak for 475 plus uh, trustees. I think um, systemically, if those things are the right things to do, and that 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 takes us as far as uh, um, if those are the right if those are the right steps to move forward, uh, mm -hmm. I think that I think the trustees should be driving that. I think uh, and 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 to uh, Wendy's point of of having collaboration uh, for a uh, um, to solve a, a, a common problem. I think that's a, the, the the perfect. Um, I think that's the ideal way to go. And I don't think I, I think it'd be very hard pressed to find somebody who disagrees with that. Trustees. Well, Trustees rely on administrators to give them how they should support their budgets. Trustees don't want to rock the boat. They rely on administrators to tell them this, we need to do this, we need to do this. 
This is all student success and a heck with part-time faculty. They're at-will employees, as Wendy had pointed out. Unions are seeing that, not just part-time faculty, but also full-time faculty. They're seeing that. They see the rubber. It appears John might have um, cut out a little bit. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I do I'm, see Jose's hand is up. Yes. Maybe. Uh, um, th thank you, Anne and Thomas. And, and, and I just pathetic. want to... Sorry. I just want to uh, bring together a couple of comments from Kent and Wendy. I think there were uh, two really important pieces of information that I was able to catch up, maybe more. Um, but essentially, I think that working together is key because just like it's happening in this panel, the way the allocations happen at, at the state level and I'm not talking about just California. I mean, it's just a political issue across the entire country are meant to get the different groups fighting for that little bit of what was given, which is exactly what we're seeing in this panel. So it's your fault, it's my fault, it's anyone's fault. But in reality, rather than keep fighting for that little bit of the pie, the piece of the pie, as Wendy mentioned, it is important for groups to collaborate and come together in what the long-term strategy to try to correct a long-term problem has to be. Because um, as Willa mentioned on the organization of communities in which people come under one umbrella and get specific benefits and work conditions and so on, that is nothing new uh, in industry, but we don't even talk about that as an alternative way to get us to get to a solution. The other part with this is, yes, very true. We got in the last few years about $150 million in, um, in, 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 in money to hire faculty. But when you look at it, that money is tricky to give, right? Because the state only pays for a percentage of the faculty. They're not paying for the real cost. And then on the following cycle, the numbers are reset, which means that you get the money next year, we'll reassess it again. And it's not necessarily a long-term commitment to continue to um, maintain the growth that is expected. And that happens, in, in my opinion, because we, we don't necessarily get together and put a plan in which we can actually operationalize a lot of this. And I think the $200 million that are being allocated um, from the state, it's a good opportunity to allocate those dollars in a different way because I'm not, I, I can't predict the future, but I am almost positive that if we get $200 million this time around and it's given to the districts in the same exact way that has been given in the past, we were gonna have a million solutions that will lead to a similar situation. And next year, you will not get another $200 million. The conditions to change it need to turn that money into recurrent support to the issue that we are going to correct. I, I, think, we could all agree, I think we could all agree, though, if we had universal health care, we wouldn't be having this discussion. We don't. That's so we not to, true. We, we, we still have, have working conditions are bad. We, we still have to figure out, and the question on health care, the question becomes, how do we get to a solution to it? And one of the, one of the places where that's done all over the country where there's collective bargaining is at the bargaining table. And that's where the dialogue goes goes in. And what one of the things that's done frequently to resolve the issues involving healthcare is bringing experts in who can help both sides understand the issues and how to, how to create a system to, to uh, maximize monies that are available. And that's something that could be done at the bargaining table or it could be done collaboratively through labor management structure both those things but but ultimately i think going back to sort of what's been discussed i think there has to be a will i mean there has to be a genuine desire to get to this so that it's particularly at a point our students our families our teachers 
everyone and our administrators have all been suffering for the past two years through the pandemic. If there ever was a time where we have learned about the importance of healthcare, it is now, it's been the past few years. So I think we have to take that knowledge of what we've just been through and what we may be continuing to go through and start thinking about, okay, this, this is a pot of money that's been allocated. How are we going to create a situation to make sure that everyone has healthcare? Um, through through the system that's uh, that California has um, is is creating. One question yeah, that yeah. we wanted to get right. at is in terms of the students um, that the community colleges do serve. They are di a diverse body of students. They are among the most diverse, but the faculty are not. And to what extent do the current circumstances affect the recruitment? Um, the pipeline of diverse faculty into community I, colleges. I think that's an enormous problem because I, you know, when I have uh, people that I've mentored that want to become a faculty member, I don't want to put them on a path where they can't sustain themselves, right? So we're, we've created uh, a circumstance where we need to bring in new, fresh ideas, younger, diverse faculty to, um, and, and it, and it is very difficult when we've created a system where the chances of getting a full-time position and being able to sustain yourself are, are very small. So, you know, by fixing uh, this uh, state of, um, you know, sort of a two-tier system of faculty would help us bring in more faculty that are diverse, that would be able to help our students um, grow. And is it is about the students. And I don't, I, I think that's what we keep losing sight of is that when we have, um, you know, 65, I think, percent of the classes now taught by part-time faculty who, who can't dedicate themselves to a campus and are struggling to survive, we're doing a disservice to our students as well if as I, those faculty. If I may add here, I've applied for full-time position throughout the 1990s and early 2010, up to 2010, and I gave up after work. And I've always gone back and asked the secretaries or the people who are HR, hey, who did you hire? And I had about 20 live interviews. It was pretty good. And one time I got to the second level. They said three things to me. One, they have a PhD, which I don't have. Two, they publish, which I don't publish. Three, this is the kicker. Oh, they, they have full-time teaching experience, not part-time. There you go, three strikes. And then on top of that with low pay, bad working condition, no office hours, et cetera, who in the world, a person of color, wants to enter a workforce to get experience? They're not gonna do it. They're smarter than me. On the question of diversity though, I think what, what was just said, I think it's important to realize the more that there is a process that someone hired as an adjunct has a pathway to becoming a full-time faculty member and it's regularized through a system, the more likely it is to be able to recruit uh, a faculty of color and others. But we have to remember that many people are coming, graduating with substantial student debt and we didn't discuss student debt and what it means in terms of the load for 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 um, for the non tenure track faculty, the adjunct faculty, um, with the the the, the scope of their uh, compensation. So that's just another factor, and I think. I hope everyone on this panel agrees that the need for diverse, diversity among faculty should be a priority. And, and the question is the means of doing that. And I think the more that there's a pathway to a, a, a full-time position with a, um, a good compensation package, the more likely that will, will, uh, will take place. Um, so we're hiring right now and we get hundreds of applicants almost for every position, diverse pool. And the, the notion the faculty are not applying, it is incorrect. That is what is happening across the state. Faculty are being hired. What is important, and I think is um, troubling, I'm a person of color. So saying the people of color don't apply because this or that is not necessarily uh, something that as a person of color find welcoming. When we look at the composition at the faculty in the state of California, there are no people of color in the majority. When we look at the composition of all the leadership 
of faculty at the state of California, there are very few people of color. So hiring, and uh, the data does not come from me, it's published in the chancellor's office uh, website and for the campaign of college opportunity in an assessment of all levels of higher education in California, breaking down by ethnicity. So, so to hire people of color, I think we need to not only, yes, address the issues of working conditions, but address the systemic issues that prevent people of color from being part of a workforce that is predominantly white and prevent the discrimination to moving into leadership positions in a, in a situation that is predominantly white. So speaking only of money and then throwing the people of color wouldn't do this or that, I do not think it's a comprehensive view of what is happening and what it takes to hire people of color. It goes as far as training or hiring panels for uh, implicit biases. And I think we all have been guilty of implicit biases, whether we are of color or not, we all have. But panels tend to hire what they reflect. And if we do not diversify panels, we will continue to hire in the same way we have been doing. And this is not a comment based on race, it's a comment based in diversification, it's a much larger compensation than just simply throw ethnicity into how people are compensated. Well, we have now gone a minute past the hour, and I really do appreciate everyone's time, everyone in front of the camera and also behind the camera answering a lot of the questions that have been asked during this hour. Clearly a, a topic that's worthy of discussion, worthy of continued discussion, and really figuring out what the way forward is. I thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Thomas for moderating and thank you again to our funders who make these kinds of conversations possible and to the ECMC Foundation. Thank you everyone, have a wonderful week.